Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to a distant fairy tale land. I must warn you, though, this isn't your grandma's fairy tale land. This is a land full of princesses, of dragons, of magic, of knights in shining armor. Except it is kinda, mmm, boring. A land so dull, it'll make your first period history class in high school feel like Christmas morning. A story so utterly boring that it'll make your great aunt Sheila's story about her neighbor's second husband's cousin seem more interesting than the latest superhero blockbuster. You are about to embark with me on a tedious trek, an odyssey of monotony, an expedition of ennui. My thesaurus aside, you are going to be bored. So, so incredibly bored that you might even fall asleep. And what a concept that would be. Before we begin our journey to our boring, boring land full of boring, boring, did I mention boring people? Let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space that we are in here and now. And don't worry if you don't speak sleepy time narrator. That means we're going to do some meditation stuff. Sounds pretty dull, right? Close your eyes. Truthfully, they should probably be closed already. I mean, we are here to fall asleep and relax, aren't we? I'm sure the ceiling of your home has some really interesting things going on. But let's try looking at your eyelids instead. Remember, we're aiming for the most boring things we can find here. With your eyes closed, allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Whether you're sleeping on your side, your stomach, or your back like a vampire, we don't judge here. Though we do hang garlic outside our doors, so don't get any ideas. For a moment, let us try and imagine that the bed you are sleeping on is not a bed at all. It's actually a cloud. Stay with me here. Picture the white, fluffy cloud beneath you. It's warm and soft to the touch like a bed of giant cotton balls. Now, coil your hand into a tiny, soft fist and gently toss every science lesson you've ever had off the edge of this warm, comfy, cozy cloud. Because tonight, it is all about imagination. Feel the cloud as it lifts up, pulling away from the ground and sailing up into the beautiful evening sky. You drift up into the orange, pink, and purple sunset like you're a certain copyrighted character on a, let's say, enchanted rug of some kind. Up here, 
Perhaps you even feel like you're in a whole new world. As you're safely floating atop this magical cloud, you feel a light breeze brush over your skin, soothing you as that last bit of warmth from the sun kisses your body. And up here, cradled so carefully by the heavens, you are able to really pay attention to how you feel. Turn your attention to your head. Often when we're having trouble sleeping, it's because we have a downpour of thoughts cascading their way through our noggins. It's pretty rude of our brains, if you ask me. But you know what I like to do to things and people that are rude? I like to pretend they're my grandmother's yarn. This may not be your grandma's fairy tale, but I would like you to imagine a grandmother's yarn in your head. It's all coiled up and tangled, tightly wound, surely dotted with hard candies that she had resting in a bowl somewhere. Not the strawberry ones, though, because someone has undoubtedly eaten all of those. Imagine any racing thoughts you are having are contained within this tangled ball of yarn. It can seem overwhelming and hard to manage. It can seem challenging to tackle. But it begins with just pulling one bit of the string. Imagine digging your fingers into that soft ball of yarn. Watch as your fingers work to grab the loose end of the yarn, and then, ever so gently, as they begin to pull that piece, unwind it bit by bit, before your very eyes, feel that ball of yarn untangling more and more and with it, any tension and pressure in your head melting away, and racing thoughts slowing down, because all your focus is on that ball of colorful yarn. Keep working that yarn slowly, until finally, you have nothing but a pile of yarn lying there, untangled and totally manageable. If you'd like, you can pretend you've crocheted a blanket with it. Just make sure you make one for me as well. Now that we have taken the time to find comfort and relax in the place that we are in, here and now. Let us begin our sleep story. Let us travel to this utterly boring, boring, insipid land. Just don't say I didn't warn you, okay? It was a brilliant, Sunny day in the kingdom of rainbow dreamland magic topia tropolis. Ah, you certainly know rainbow dreamland magic topia tropolis, the most beautiful kingdom in all the land. A land full of valleys and forests where the trees are made of sugary sweets where gumdrop bushes dot the land, and there's even bubblegum 
that can be a five-course meal. There's a beautiful river that's made entirely of chocolate, and sometimes children sail down the river eating gum that can be a five-course meal. There are even small orange people who, ahem, sorry, I think I might be getting my stories mixed up here. That story is much, much too exciting. Now, Rainbow Dreamland Magic Topiatropolis isn't that kind of kingdom. It is a kingdom in a valley, surrounded by mountains on all sides. There are meadows of wildflowers and isolated towers where women toss their hair out to dry it, just to dry it, not for anyone to climb it or anything, because that would be a little ridiculous, wouldn't it? Rainbow Dreamland Magictopiatropolis was a land of dreams and rainbows indeed. It was also viewed by many as a utopia, and by some as a bustling metropolis. It truly is a shame they couldn't come up with a more accurate name for the kingdom. Deep within Rainbow Dreamland Magic Topiatropolis, lived a king, a king who looked unlike any king you've ever seen before. He was a short, balding man with gray hair and a rounded belly that jiggled when he laughed. He had a superior air about him, and he flashed smiles at photographers like he was a rare, undiscovered animal they had somehow found on a safari. On second thought, perhaps he looked a lot like kings you've seen before. Either way, the king's name was King Majesty, or King Majesty Lordship the Fourth if you're more of the formal type. The king was a rather lonely man, even though he did pay people to laugh at his jokes. To cope with his loneliness as a king, he decided to get married and have children. He was only blessed with one daughter, a daughter by the name of Prim. Prim the Princess, as the people of Rainbow Dreamland Magictopiatropolis often called her. From the moment she was born, Prim the Princess was doted on. She was, after all, the heir to the throne and was quickly the most beloved baby in all the kingdom. People showered her with gifts and attention, and she lovingly soaked up every little bit of it. When she was little, she felt blessed to be a princess. But by the time she reached her teen years, things started to get a bit strange. People asked her when her father was going to send her away to live in a tower where no one could ever find her. They warned Prim that she should start growing out her hair now. She didn't particularly like the idea of that. Short hair suited her face and she didn't quite like the idea of a full-grown adult man 
scaling her hair like a firefighter, trying to get a cat out of a tree. She asked her father if he was going to put her in a tower. Her father laughed, telling her no. Of course he wouldn't throw her into an isolated tower somewhere. After all, this wasn't his grandmother's bedtime storyland. But then, people started asking her even stranger things, and odd people began to approach Prim on her morning walks. One day, a woman with purple tentacles emerged from the nearby river. She offered to take Prim's legs and make her a mermaid in exchange for her voice. After all, there were handsome mermen down beneath the water that Prim could get to know. Prim politely declined. After all, if she wanted to go out for a night where her date did all the talking, she would just try online dating again. Prim continued on her morning walk, shaking her head in disbelief, feeling a bit uneasy and craving some normalcy. She did what she did every morning. She sang to the birds who surrounded her and sang back, looking upon her as if she was the sun itself. She had a strange affinity for woodland creatures, but she was sure that had nothing to do with her being a princess in a fairy tale land. Surely, the creatures just liked her vibes. But as Prim rounded a corner in the forest, she was surprised to see a strange beast of a man stalking through the woods with a cape. He looked upon her with shame, dramatically shielding his face from her with the cape. He stared over the edge of the ruby red fabric like Nosferatu himself, and in a booming, deep voice, he warned the princess not to look upon him. For I am a beast, an ugly, hideous beast who no one will ever love, he declared. Well, not with that attitude, Prim the princess chimed. The beast stood there, dumbfounded. Are you not disgusted by me? He asked, his claws quivering as he fiddled with the edge of his cape. Prim told the beast that no, she was not disgusted by him. There were much worse things in the woods than a beast dressed in fine Victorian clothes with a deep, raspy voice, surprisingly wispy hair, and very human eyes. The beast stood there, dumbfounded as Prim the princess continued on, journeying through the forest without a care in the world. She wandered past the children following gumdrops to the evil witch's house. And though she tried to warn them, they continued on. She supposed they were just in that phase of childhood where they'd have to escape an evil witch. We all go through it, after all. And most of us make it out the other side unscathed and full of candy. Finally, Prim returned home to her Lux, beautiful castle with a moat. When she arrived there, 
she was surprised to see a large group of men lined up at the castle gates. When the men saw her, they swarmed her like they were teenage girls, and she was an early 2000s boy band. She hurried away and ducked into her father's chambers, hoping to get answers about the strange men on her doorstep. But when she asked her father, the answer he had for her was less than satisfying. He told her that the men were here to try and take her hand in marriage. Prim told her father she had no interest in marriage and certainly no interest in marrying men that lined up around the castle and swooned at the mere sight of a royal woman. Her father told his daughter not to worry. All he had to do was tell the men about the curse that was put upon her when she was a child, and she would be saved from marriage. Prim looked upon her father in disbelief. She had never heard she was cursed. I mean, naturally, she assumed something was wrong with her. But she thought that stemmed from having the father that she did. Her father told her that, indeed, she did have a terribly strange curse. A curse that would send all the men running for the hills. A curse that would ensure she was never married. King Majesty began to make his way for the double doors that led to the balcony, overlooking where the men were gathered. Prim tried to grab his arm to hold him back and get more information about this curse before he shared it with the world. But it was no use. Her father swung his arms wide and gazed down upon the men gathered there. Young men of this kingdom, I know you have come for my daughter's hand in marriage. You all want to be Mr. Prim Majesty, and I cannot place blame upon you for that. Unfortunately, my daughter has a terrible, no good curse. A curse that'll pull off the hair from your chest and shake you to your very core. The men all held their breath. Some peeked under their shirts just to make sure that their hair was still there. The king took another deep breath, ready to tell the world his daughter's curse. Once I tell of the curse, it is to become true. Anyone who speaks to my daughter uninvited will turn into a pile of goo. And now that this secret is shared with you, my daughter shall slumber until this curse is seen through. A loud thump sounded behind the king. He turned to see his daughter collapsed on the ground, snoring rather loudly. It only dawned on the king in that moment what had been done. He had unlocked the curse upon his daughter. It wasn't a curse given at birth, but please give the man a break. He is a silly king after all, and he never did take an English 101 class in fairy tale high school. Deciphering poems is a challenging task when you lack analytical skills. 
News spread like wildfire across the kingdom about what had happened to poor Princess Prim. People mourned the fact that their beloved princess had fallen into such a slumber. Unsure of what exactly to do, the king carried his daughter into her favorite spot on the property, a cozy little cottage by the edge of the river. Desperate for his daughter to awaken, every morning he filled the room with all of her favorite things. He was not much of a chef, but he whipped her up a full tray of lemon poppy seed muffins every single morning. He even made a glaze once he finally figured out what zest was. He would sit by the window where the fragrant river breeze would waft in, gently blowing the tart, delicious smell of the lemon poppy seeds his daughter's direction. It was an act of love every day, followed by an act of hunger by the time noon came around and he decided the muffins belonged in his stomach. He filled the room with wildflowers picked from the nearby meadows, which had been one of Prim's favorite pastimes. The wildflowers had not been picked by him, of course. He was a king. Manual labor was not on his list of approved activities. Some days, he would bring out his dad joke book and read joke after joke after joke to prim the princess. But for some strange reason that he couldn't put his finger on, Prim seemed to sleep even deeper when he told his jokes. Eventually, the men of the kingdom decided that it was their job to awaken Prim from her slumber. Day after day, men would line up outside the cottage, ready to try their hand at awakening the beautiful, intelligent Prim. But time after time, soon after the men opened their mouths to speak, they would dissolve into a sticky pile of goo. It happened in the blink of an eye. News of this spread across the whole kingdom, but, desperate to have his daughter awaken, the king allowed it to continue for quite some time. Her favorite things couldn't awaken her, and neither could the surely hilarious to a twenty-year-old woman jokes he was telling. So, he watched day in and day out as more and more men entered the cottage, and more and more men came out as nothing but piles of goo. A kind of rivalry began amongst the men. They all talked themselves up, saying that they would be the one to awaken the princess. Soon, despite the fact that they would surely be turned into goo, dozens of men were showing up daily. And that's when the king realized what kind of danger his kingdom was in. They were losing their population of young men by the day, and that meant the king would have no men to work for him, no men to go to war for him. Though he wanted his daughter to wake up desperately, 
he knew that his kingdom had to come first. And so, when asking the men to stop trying to awaken his daughter didn't work, the king did what all the other fairy tale mothers and fathers and aunties had told him to do. He decided to put her in a tower far, far away, where no one in the world would be able to find her. Well, at least for a few weeks. The tower was across treacherous land, and I'm not talking about roads filled with potholes. There were valleys, canyons, mountains, deserts, fields of lava. And, last but not least, there was a bridge to the tower guarded by a dragon. A fire-breathing dragon, to be precise. The king thought it was a nice touch, and truly, it was. He was the talk of the town during all the parent of a cursed child meetings at the local taverns. And so, high, high up in a tower that was impossible to reach, guarded by a dragon, Prim the princess slept and slept and slept and finally got a little peace and quiet. Actually, now that I mention that, it does sound kind of nice. Back in town, the talk of the princess didn't diminish. Men talked about their theories for awakening her. Some thought it would just take a good pickup line. Others thought that perhaps simply saying her name would work. Others thought that giving her a primrose was the right trick. However, none were brave or strong enough to make it across the land. Until one day, a man on an all-white horse rode into town. Actually, he wasn't a man at all. In fact, he was a knight. And his armor? Oh, it was shining. He breezed through town, drawing many looks as he rode straight for the castle. When he got off his horse, he was recognized by the people of the castle almost immediately. His name was Jack Hiroson IV, and he had grown up in this town. In fact, he was one of the one and only friends of Princess Prim when she was growing up. The king was thrilled to see him. He raced to his side and told him the news, at which Jack Hiroson politely nodded. He had heard the news already, but this seemed like an important moment for the king, so he allowed him to have it. Jack Hiroson valiantly stood before the king and promised that he and he alone would awaken Princess Prim from her slumber. He would return the princess to her kingdom and save the future of the city. Old King Majesty was overjoyed. He thanked Jack Hiroson and wished him well on his journey, even providing Jack with a mighty sword. Jack sailed across the land on the back of his valiant steed, an unstoppable force of a horse named Sugarcube. Sugarcube was the kind of horse who made all the other horses quake with fear. He was a true warrior of a horse, 
the perfect horse to face off against a dragon with. And so, Jack trudged through the land on the back of his horse, a picture of bravery. Well, to people who had never seen true bravery before, anyway. He wound his way through the valleys and mountains. Sugar Cube trudged through the mud with no hesitation, bringing Jack further and further along his quest to save the princess. In the desert is where Jack was tested for the very first time. There was no water for miles, and Sugar Cube was stumbling in the high desert sun. Jack was really starting to regret the night and shining armor thing. He was really wishing he was a knight in a comfy, breathable tank top instead, or maybe a shirtless knight. But being in a fairy tale made his options very, very limited. Finally, Jack made it through the desert. He dove into the first river he found and drank as much water as he could manage. Sugar Cube did the same and was thankfully able to avoid melting. But the biggest task of all laid right before them because just outside the bridge that led to the castle, there was a dragon awaiting them, a fire-breathing beast who could destroy them with something as simple as an evil glance. Jack readied his sword, prepared in earnest for battle. He rode through the tree line finally catching sight of the dragon for the first time. He was ready to lay eyes on a fearsome beast, a beast with razor-sharp teeth and claws. But instead, he found a dragon lying on his stomach, picking at his nails and kicking his feet behind him all willy-nilly like a girl in an 80s movie. Jack put down his sword. The dragon sighed. Good on you for putting the sword down, because honestly, I like, really don't feel like dragoning it today, you know? Clearly, it was a millennial dragon. Jack cautiously asked the dragon what he felt like doing instead. We could just like talk, the dragon answered. And so they did. Jack listened to the dragon as he talked about all his problems. The other dragons had shinier scales, but this dragon couldn't help it. All dragon dermatologists were out of town. The other dragons could breathe more fire, but, like, was more fire even necessary? Jack listened to the dragon in earnest, giving the dragon advice and providing what the dragon asked for. And when the sun finally started to set, the dragon thanked Jack Hero Sun. He asked him if he'd like a boost up to the tower, and Jack said that indeed he would. The dragon lifted Jack up to the castle. A sliver of moonlight shone in through the stained glass, illuminating Prim the princess in an ethereal glow. It was a movie moment, 
and as Jack got closer, he saw how truly awful the princess looked. Really, truly. After all, she'd been asleep for weeks. Her hair hadn't been combed. Her skincare routine was in ruins. She had eye crusts for days. But Jack smiled. Her being a mess was exactly how he remembered her. He thought of the curse, of what all the other men had done. And so, instead of talking to her, he simply sat down beside her and waited, and waited, and waited, until finally, Prim took a deep breath and sprung out of bed. She wrapped her arms around Jack, thanking him for being the only one to understand how to break Prim's curse. She simply had to be left alone by someone for a little bit. Jack leaned against the tower wall with her. We don't have to go back, you know, he said. Prim smiled and took Jack by the hand. Oh, I don't plan on it. The two lived the rest of their lives in that cozy little tower. They chatted with their dragon friend by day and cuddled in the tower by night. It was everything they could have asked for. I hope you have enjoyed this story, even though it was incredibly, incredibly boring. I do apologize for making you suffer through such an utterly uninteresting tale. I truly do hope it has helped you get a night of peaceful, restful sleep. But please, if you'd like, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams from myself and Sugar Cube, the Valiant Steed.